Omaha. We're going to do it this time. I promise you. Last time we got our flights canceled. This time we're taking a straight shot. I'll be there Friday, March 29th and Saturday, March 30th. Columbus, Ohio. I'm fired up to head your way. Never been there. My first time coming to your beautiful city. I'll be there Friday, April 12th and Saturday, April 13th. Los Angeles. I'm excited to announce that I'm part of the Netflix is a joke festival. I have my own show Sunday, May 12th at the Bourbon Room. You guys ask me, how come you're not on Netflix? Well, here's a chance to sell this thing out and show them why I should be. Get your tickets now. Don't wait. All tickets available at ryansickler.com. The Honeydew with Ryan Sickler. Welcome back to the Honeydew, y'all. We're over here doing it in the Night Pass Studios. I'm Ryan Sickler, ryansickler.com, and Ryan Sickler on all your social media. I'm going to start this episode like I start every episode. Whether you've been here, whether you're new here, thank you. Thank you for supporting this show. Thank you for supporting anything I do. All right. If you got to have more, then you got to check out the Patreon. It's called The Honeydew with Y'all, and it's this show with y'all. And I'm telling you, every week I say, We're not going to hear something different. And every week you guys deliver. It is the craziest stories you're going to hear anywhere. It's five bucks a month. All right. You also get this show a day early. You get it ad free. No extra cost. That show has been five bucks a month since we started. It's hundreds of episodes for five bucks. All right. Uh, And the way back, the new podcast. Thank you guys for supporting it. It's crushing right now. I love that you're enjoying it. We've got more and more coming for you. So make sure you subscribe to that and come see me on tour. If I'm in town when you're around, all tickets are available at ryansickler.com. All right, that's it. That's the biz. You know what we do over here? We highlight the lowlights. I always say these are the stories behind the storytellers. I am very excited to have this guest on here. First time on the Honeydew. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Jim Norton. Welcome to the Honeydew, Jim. Thank you. Thank you. This is long overdue. This is something I've been waiting for. and I'm, I'm a big fan. Thank you. I love all you New York guys from back in the day, especially. Yeah. I'm surprised to ask you before we started talking. You said you're 55. You look fucking great. Thank you. Yeah. I, uh, years ago, I started putting lotion on and I quit smoking. Like, those are probably the things that helped me. I quit smoking in uh, I like 2001. That the lotion was before oh, yeah. the smoke. <laughs> yeah. Put, put lotion on skin ceuticals every night. Um, I'm like an old lady. You have right a skin routine? Yeah. Do yeah, you yeah, really? Yeah. Yeah, Jim Norton has a bedtime facial routine. I do because good skin. Like I, I've always been kind of smooth. It's like the only thing physically I have going for me is is the fact that my skin is smooth. Anything else is a disaster. It's interesting. Anytime I've had a, a lady touch my arm or something, say so your your skin's smooth. I always think like, what are you touching? Like alligator? Like what are other dudes doing out there? That I know, right? Yeah, for it's me, nice it's more like smooth just, skin, Jim Norton. No right. hair, like little, yeah. just little baby tits. You know, yeah. I think that they, uh, <laughs> I think they like that feeling, that smooth, soft feeling of a boy (laughs) before we get into everything please plug and promote all of it uh just the only thing i'll promote is i'm on tour now i have a bunch of dates jimnorton.com if you want to uh i mean i'm on the west coast i'm on the east coast and also um my wife and i do a a youtube channel it's uh at nikki and jim nyc n-i-k-k-i and jim nyc and that's what i'm doing with my wife so if you want to see it it's just a little slice of life shit but it's fun to do and something I've wanted to do for a long time. Well, you really resonate with me because, again, before we started recording, we were talking about you just got married. And yeah. You're 55. I'm 51. Well, I'm 51 in, in March, but I've never been married. I've uh, been engaged, but never been married. And you said, man, I never even thought I would do it. Never live. No, no. kids. No nothing. And then all of a sudden you find someone that shifts everything for right. you. Yeah, I never. So wanted. ages. Did you ever? Did you ever age? Your, did you ever put a number on yourself? A cap? Like if it didn't happen by fifty five, I'm I'm not even gonna try. Yeah, or I'm shutting off. Did nineteen. Do? I said if it doesn't happen <laughs> by nineteen. I'm f-ing finished. Never. Nineteen. I didn't want it. I didn't want it. I had no desire. Every married guy I talked to is miserable. It's always the, the lack of sex and the and just the fact that everything dies. Uh, I just didn't want to do it. But my fiance at the time was from. Uh, uh, Norway. So she couldn't get in the country. We were having a whole thing over a minor marijuana issue. So then someone said, we'll do a fiance visa. And I'm like, that means I really have to get married. Um, so in 2019, we got engaged and, uh, 
We got married two years ago here in the States once she got in. But uh, I'm glad I did it because I actually really like it. I like being married. You do? I never thought I would. Yeah, like when I when I want to go off and do stuff, like if I want to just like jerk off or look at escort ads or do any of that stuff, I'm like, okay, I can't do that stuff because there was some fun to that. But the, the what I get from being married is worth it. Yeah, the like, trade off. The trade off is worth it. Is worth yeah, it. Yeah. A little. It's yeah. not a, not by a long shot, but by a little bit. Being married beats my old life. My old life was very lonely at times. Yeah, sure. but there's also something to be said about, and I get this too. Even with comedy, it's a solo sport. Everything's independent. You yeah. grow into these things that you like and your ways of doing things, and you don't want to change necessarily. You don't want to buck what you got going. It's right. not the worst. It might not be the best, but God forbid. Something could come in here and ruin all of this I yeah. got going on. But you left yourself open. I did, yeah. And and I really had to make a decision. How much do I like this this woman I'm with? Like, um, we knew that a fiance visa is the only way she'd be able to come in and visit in the States. And then in the pan she was staying in Canada and I was going up and visiting her every weekend. I would drive up to Montreal. I'd do radio Monday through Thursday. As soon as the radio show was over, I hop in the car, drive to Montreal, spend Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and drive home Sunday morning and repeat. Um, and I went up there March of 2020, my producer said, they're going to close the border so that I wouldn't have been able to oh, go yeah. see her. So I just drove up with a suitcase and I stayed for 15 months. I stayed in Canada the whole pandemic. I was broadcasting. I was on an ISDN line broadcasting, uh, cause we weren't allowed at Sirius. Sirius XM had said no more. So for like a week we were home. So the fact that I, like I was already not allowed in the studio anyway because of COVID, it just worked out. So I was forced to live with someone for 15 months and I'd never lived with a person before. It really was crazy. It was like one day I was living by myself and then the next day I'm just living with someone in Montreal. For, it was that quick. And I didn't, I didn't have time to panic and f it up. I was just there and living it. So uh, the, the pandemic was great for me. Like it, and so were you allowed to go up there and stay that long? Americans can go for six months. And, the and then we just have to get it renewed or something. Renewed, yeah. And the Canadians are great. Like they're really, they're panicky about COVID, but they allowed her to come in, even though she had that little marijuana thing. They allowed her to have a student visa. So she went to school. Um, and I wound up just renewing every time. But what yeah, happened- Yeah, they're strict. Because I know buddies that have had DUIs that couldn't go do JFL because they can't drive across the board. You can't get up there with a DUI. That's right. Here. Very yeah. strict about that. But a little marijuana, her charge was so small. They said they just wanted to make sure she had paid the fine. It was like a $100 fine. And they let her in. It was not a problem. Um, but what, the way it works is if you, re, if you apply to renew your visa- you can stay while they adjudicate that. So if it takes three extra months, which it did because these embassies were closed, I was totally legal to be there. So then by the time they said yes, I would have to reapply because it was almost six months, but they were great. So I love the Canadians. I love Montreal. And, uh, yeah, Montreal's I, great. It is, but every they were worse than the US with COVID. They were panicking and we were in the house by eight o'clock. It was really, oh, uh, really claustrophobic, yeah. I didn't jack off once in 15 months. It's crazy. I, but it I, forced you into marriage and love. Well, yeah, but it also forced me to not jerk off, which is, <laughs> was very bizarre. I really wanted to. Uh, what, okay, 15 months is insane. Okay? Yeah. Because I imagine, how old are you when you start? Jerking off? Yeah. Uh, you know, I was probably 12. I think 12 was the first time I actually ever got, got it all the way. And I was like, oh, yeah, I get it. And up until a couple of years ago, had you ever had a layoff like that? Never more than... 30 days or 40 yeah. days I tried. Now I'm back to it, by the way. Um, this is the minute I got back to the US. I think as soon as I waved goodbye to the border guard in fucking upstate New York, I just jerked off on Route 80. I was fucking, <laughs> I, it was really bad. Um, I, I didn't waste any time when I got back, but I was happy that I could do it. I was happy I went at that time, um, but it was very difficult. It was a weird time for everybody. All right, so let's jump back to the beginning. Let's yeah. go back to the beginning because there's a reason you don't want to be in a relationship and everything. Tell me about where you're from originally, your parents, family, that kind of thing. Family, I mean, I don't know what's normal and what's not normal. I, mean, I think they're amen. normal. Amen. You know? Amen. I think my parents are normal. I mean, the uh, thing I've always loved about you, I know people are going to be like, shut up, let them talk. But I just want to say this is you've just, you've never been, you've always been out. Yeah. You've always been out there with your wild side, your freak side, your e comedy person, whatever. You've always been unashamed and you've just been you. And I've loved that about you because, you know, there's a lot of guys that that are 
find it hard to be themselves. Yeah. And especially in comedy, you know, you don't even know who the fuck you are till you're in this thing for a long time. You're fine. But you've always been true to you, I feel like. And you've you've never wavered on any of it. And I've, I, I've always dug that about you. Thank you. Uh, but you're saying that there was no shame. That's incorrect. I, I'm, I'm actually shame personified. I am. <laughs> I am a walking pile of fat titted shame, but I've learned to make it funny. <laughs> oh, there's a lot of shame. <laughs> it goes Let's more. talk about it. Yeah, I don't know where it's from. It's always that whole like not deserving or not feeling, not not the. There's a difference. Like the shame is always legitimate, and uh, I, I don't I'm not, I don't enjoy it. It's just there. Um, and then you see like I love when you see really good looking comics and that doesn't mean that they don't have problems but when you see good looking people playing the oh shucks girls don't like me and then they purposefully comb their hair a little awkward and it's like no that's not really who you are you're very confident and it reads nothing wrong with being confident but just be confident like yeah. don't pretend you're shy and uh, you know i don't know if the girls will like me yeah you do yes you do um so it always that that kind of reads i prefer a guy like jeselnik who's a good looking guy but is is so himself on stage, and so you, you know the joke is going to be barbaric. Um, he's not. There's no aw shucks. It's just this is what he does. Like, yep. if you're going to be a good looking guy and a confident guy, be like Anthony Jeselnik, mm -hmm. where you're just being true to that. You know what I mean? Love Jeselnik. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do too. And he performs like a guy who is a good looking, confident guy. So I respect that a lot more than people who are pretending to be something they're not. It'd Did be you? like if I tried to be confident and good looking, it wouldn't work. Nobody would believe it. Did you grow up in like a strict household, religious household? What are your parents like? Were they married, divorced? Married, still married. Still um, married. Still living, still married. Um, uh, strict with me. My sister, seven years younger, she got away with a lot more. Like I couldn't watch rated R movies until I was 18. Oh, they um, really went for it. Huh? Really, it I feel like it was 17. Was I feel like it was Yeah, 17. yeah, but for me, there was an extra, yeah, an extra like, year in the Norton household for maturity. Uh <laughs> I think they finally gave in because I remember I was obsessed with Clockwork Orange growing up, mm -hmm. and uh, they overdisciplined me a little bit, like with 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 uh, you got to be in by nine thirty, and you know just panicked that something bad was going to happen to me or whatever. But when you discipline someone like that, you know when when they are able to do what they want, you know they wind up driving through New Brunswick, getting prostitutes every night of the week. <laughs> 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 it's your fault, mom and dad. <laughs> so wait, were you on, did you follow the rules up until then and then it was all hell breaks loose or were you still, you know, being a bit of a hellion then too? I was doing what I wanted to you do. You were. Yeah, sure. Even I, within their rules though, you were, you were, were you pushing the limits on your curfew yeah, and all Yeah, or that? getting locked out of the house when I wouldn't come home. If you're drunk and you don't come home, they just lock me out. So At what age is up. that? 15, 16, You would come 14. home drunk like that? Yeah. Who, they'd lock you out? Lock you out. Just sub it's typical suburban stuff. You know what I Where mean? Where did you grow up? North Brunswick, New okay. Jersey. All right. Um, oh, so you stayed local for the prostitutes then? I did. I you would go down to New Brunswick when I finally discovered that I was like 18 or 19. And uh, oh, because I was, I was too pathetic to meet girls. And I found these areas and I would just see the same girls over and over. I got to know all of them and I uh, would drive them back up from New Brunswick to North Brunswick and park in my parents' driveway. And we had the, uh, like, you know, I had that thing in my windshield that keeps the heat. And I would yeah, just put that shade. up. And I would put the no, sunshade up and just get blown in my driveway no, at one in the morning. It was great. Yeah. <laughs> you got your dick sucked in your parents' driveway. Many times. Lock me out now, Dad. <laughs> Many times. Yeah. And then drive because you knew that no cops were going to come hassle you in your own driveway. Yeah, that's a great idea. It was How very old free. are you doing that? I was. What's that? How old are you doing? This? 18, 19, 20, 21. Like, you and know. you would just go down and. All right, can we please talk about this? Sure. Because I've this has always terrified me. It's terrified me. So we've got a, a spot in Baltimore I used to go to. It's called Chaps Pit Beefs. It's a pit beef. It's a great pit beef spot in the parking lot of a strip club. Okay, that also happens to be a section where the ladies walk. Truck drivers come sure. through, they do their thing. And I would see them all the time. Never talk to them, never anything. I'd, you know, always like, man, that's to me, it was always like, wow, this is a lady's going to get in this dude's truck. She can get chopped into yeah, pieces, yeah, yeah. the whole thing. But also, I've always been paranoid of so many things, STDs. But the biggest one was getting arrested. You yeah. said that the cops getting caught and getting your name out there like that, or even approaching them or how to talk to them. What your first time ever? How do you, were you terrified? Like, I don't remember my first time. To no, be no, I don't remember the first time. But I did a friend convince you to do it? Like what? Who? Yes, the little friend in my lap. <laughs> <laughs> I convinced me to That's do it. it. You went solo. Oh, you didn't, there was yeah. no buddy. You're like, you want to go do no. this together? No, 
No, but I would drive around. For me, the whole ritual was just kind of looking and I would talk to them and they would have to talk to me through the window first. And I would have to know, uh, I wouldn't say anything that could get you arrested until they got in the car. And then we would talk for a minute. And then, you know, once they grab your dick, you know, okay. And once, once they get in the car, you know that they're probably working because cops don't get in the car. Usually they have you meet them around the corner. Is that right? For their own safety. Yeah. Has that happened to you before? Where Never. you knew that? Oh, no, is, no. I, I, there's a couple of times I didn't, I didn't see the person because I was a little suspicious. So I was like, oh, have a good night. Hey, what do you want to do? And they lean in. What do you want to do? I'm like, oh, just go for a ride, hang out, talk. You know, I would always work into it like that. Um, but I really, I, you know, I get attached very easily. So I met these girls and I would see the same girls all the time. And uh, my favorite part was after the sex, I would always enjoy talking to them as I drove them back. Like that would be my favorite part of it. It was sometimes I wasn't even horny. I was just lonely. And I didn't know that I was lonely because a guy you're like, I want to come, but I really didn't want to come. I wanted to just be with a girl. So I would go down and hook up or even if I just jerked off and uh, I would just love talking to them as I drove them back. That was my favorite part of it. Most times. Sometimes I just needed to. They probably liked it too, to be honest with you. Yeah, I was easy. I mean, I was easy. I was clean cut. I wasn't fucking dirty. I mean, I wasn't into anything crazy. Um, You know, I wasn't into, you know, being shitty to them. Like, yeah, eat it, bitch. You know, it's just like, you know, just blow my little suburban dick and I'll drive you back and we'll (laughs) chit chat and I'll try to pretend you were my girlfriend. That's all. Did you lose your virginity to a prostitute? No, I lost my virginity to a girl I was dating uh, in high school. I I don't remember the first sex. I was probably drunk, but um, I remember I was wearing a hat because I had cowlicks. I hated my hair so much. So I had this hat on and she was like, can you take your hat off? I was like, oh yeah, I did. And we we had sex. It was probably not good for either one of us. Then she started banging my Jamaican friend not long after, which was very hard to deal with. (laughs) His big, long dick. (laughs) I was very, very upset. So what's uh, what were you like in high school? Class clown. You that, were? Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, you know, I, that's what we do, right? It's, it's like I'm, I'm not going to do well. Uh, I didn't graduate. I dropped out senior year. You did? Why? Rehab. I went to rehab, and I was just a problem. And I just was so disconnected from all of it and all right, so All right, so let's unhappy. rewind a little bit more then. When do you start? What were you doing? Drinking, drugs, Drinking, all of drugs. It? My what dad, age did you start in that? I'm not 13. Oh, wow. But I was one of those little after school specials. It just got very bad, very fast. How'd you get into it? I'm just friends. You know, and my dad is sober, so he always knew, and I always knew there was a problem. Just, you know, pulling razors on people and just doing things that you don't normally do. Wait, like your dad would do that? No, I would. You would pull, what do you mean? Just box cutters. It was just, again, I was just a crazy little person. Um, but why are you doing just in out of anger? Yeah, no, misguided. In the house or the neighbors? Oh, no, like no, fights? just people outside um, pulling knives on people. Like, I'm so glad I didn't get my ass kicked. Like, I'm really you're lucky. You're not dead. I know. Yeah. I know. That I remember, sounds like shit somebody would shoot you for, especially in, in, in Jersey. Not where I live, though. They no. were always, you know, they were the same as I was. Again, just you know, little little suburban idiots. Um, but, yeah, I got very fortunate. I got sober when I was 18. Um yeah, but it cost me high school. I I, I didn't graduate, so. Have you ever know. gone back to get your GED? Or I anything? did three years into being sober, but I wound up not needing it. I mean, so I, I mean, that's as far as I ever went. I never wasted time in college. Not that college wasted time, but for me it would have been. I didn't want, I wanted to do this. At what point are you putting a rehab and everything? I was 17. I was mean, it an intervention or did Yeah, you just it was go? Like a suicide attempt that was quote unquote a suicide. It was more of a notice me again. You know, what'd you <laughs> but what'd you do? Cut my wrists. You did? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bad? I mean, bad is when you actually let yourself bleed out. Uh, blubbering uh, idiot who wants to be noticed is what I really was. Um, so yeah, it was embarrassing after a while. I was embarrassed. Um, but yeah, I went to rehab for a month. But it, it stuck. What they said really bothered me. Like, I, I knew that there was something uh, there. You know what, what they, I mean? What'd they say? Just about, about the personality stuff and about mm. being an alcoholic. And I knew that it wasn't normal what I was doing. And I knew all this, uh, you know, getting drunk and calling the FBI. Like, just stuff that people- what do you mean? I would just <laughs> yeah, call I the FBI. I just so used to this. I would call the FBI. Like, I, I read Tell this book. Tell them what. Who the hell? How do you even find a number for the FBI? I, back then, which is, again, the 80s, I, I would, uh, you'd call information. I remember I read this book on the Klan, and there was this Klan, Ku Klux Klan preacher. Uh-huh. So I was like, that's racist. And uh, I called up this guy. I found this guy's number on information, and I fucking called this guy and told him how wrong it was to be in the Klan. And he actually- 
talk Wait, to you me. actually called the Klan guy. The guy, I know, yeah, oh. the FBI was different. I wanted <laughs> okay, to stop them okay. from marching. Um, you know. <laughs> you found the Klan guy and he talked to you? He actually talked to me for a while. And he's like, ah, I'm out of that life now. Blah, blah, blah. And he had stopped doing it. He, was, he had been a preacher in the Klan. And he was uh, out of that life and had moved on. But this is where you'd call 411 and get the number and, and make the phone call. So, yeah. It was uh, a lot of that phone stuff. And thank God Twitter didn't exist. Thank oh, God there was yep. no social media yep. when I was a drunken. That's why I hate all these people going after people for shit they said as a teenager. Like, all right, if you're 61 and you tweet something, all right. But if you had 17 and 18, fuck you guys yeah. going after teenagers for that dumb shit. You're talking to people who've been born into a world where internet has always existed always, for them. Always, yeah. It's like a free, the highways to us. You know, like, wait, we can get on a freeway and go somewhere now? Yeah. Yeah, yeah before you couldn't do that shit, people I, don't get it. I still remember the first time I downloaded a golden shower video. It was my parents' gateway computer, and I didn't know anything about, like, I the pads the where these things go. Yeah, yeah. So I just downloaded this fucking golden shower piss video, and I had no idea where it was on the computer. I'm like, I didn't know where the downloads went. I yeah. just thought it would be on the desktop. So, uh, yeah, I mean, that's how I remember computers coming into it. And in high school, uh, they, they were teaching MS DOS prompt. And I floppy wish I disk and floppy disk and all of it. What was it? Was Lo was it Lotus? Don't remember. Was there one called Lotus? I feel like we learned a Lotus, but MS DOS. Yeah, I remember the first Apple computers they would bring in, and this guy would teach us in seventh grade. He was on it. Like we, his name was Sp I don't, probably shouldn't say it. his Mr. Spike was his yeah. name. But this dude brought in little. They were little tiny apples. They were like that. That uh, like beige color yeah yeah you know with the bubble screen it was just little shit and this dude was like this is going to be the future and we're like whatever bro yeah dude was on it he was right and i he wish i had right. learned it even though the stuff you learned back then you, you would have had to continue learning because nobody wants you know to, to to prompt in or you know when you would get the uh that awful sound of the, the fucking modem oh yeah starting up which was actually a great sound because I knew like as soon as I signed in and I was on AOL, I was like, now I can get to porn. I can get to porn and chat rooms and just, I would just jerk off reading what everybody said. It was great. What, um, do you, so do you lean into that once you become clean and sober then? Is, is, yep. is porn and sex your new thing? It was always the first thing. It was well, that the was first. the first thing from childhood. So you, you went clean and sober and everything else, but you're like, well, this one's the one we're going to keep. Right it here. really took off. Like, yeah, I mean, but the whole, my whole uh, young life, it was there. I mean, from childhood on, it was the, like the first addiction. It was the first secret, if, the first thing that felt good and first thing I was ashamed of, you know, all of it. But uh, yeah, when I got sober, I mean, that just, and I, could, I had mobility, I could drive, and I had a, you know, a phone, I could talk to other adults, you know, then it really went. I remember ordering phone sex. I forget, I had to go take a money order out, and I had to send in a money order, and they sent me certified mail with these phone numbers to call that were good for 30 days. Um, and so I was doing phone sex for, for like, I, I literally was calling women in, in California on a pay phone to try to jerk off on my way to work. And I didn't realize that it was like two in the morning there, uh, here. Uh, so yeah, it was, a, I, I really wish I had the conveniences. Forgot about those, those 976 or 900 numbers or whatever. This right? was 30 days of phone sex for one price. It was like a hundred yeah, bucks. Tell me, what do you mean? You've, and you never got ripped off from that? You'd spend a hundred bucks and you'd date. How long would it take you to get jerk off? You got to get the mails involved. It was the, the U.S. mail, a certified mail. Certified. And you would call a bunch of different you numbers. For you had to it. sign for it. Yeah, yeah. You had to be yeah. there for it. Dude. Yeah. I had to be there when the postman yeah. came. <laughs> But it came and I will still never forget getting that and being so psyched that it finally came and all these numbers, a bunch so, of different phone numbers because they probably had a bunch of different women. I've never women. heard of this one. Okay. So then you got 30 days with this set of numbers and then that's it. That's you it. They would expire. Yeah. Content. yeah, that's right. Wow. Um, but okay. they would be cranky a lot of times when I would call. <laughs> yeah, I'll you want to talk dirty now? <laughs> I remember one girl, she was so late. It was seven in the morning in New York. I didn't realize it was 4 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, that, that's how you had to do it back then. That's how you had to do it. It was very, very tactile. It was a very tactile experience. So you've been clean and sober since 18? 87, yeah, 1987. 1987. February 1st, yeah. And there's been no relapses? None. You don't look forward? You no. don't care? That's no, cool. I mean. But this I, is a tough world. I, I always admire comedians, especially that can be clean and sober in this world, because it's just everywhere you go, it's there. Every, it's our job as 
making sure these people are doing the thing you don't do. It's readily available. Yeah. But I also learned from watching other guys who have fucked up things or ruined opportunities or been really drunk. And you know, when you see people handling things poorly because they're fucked up, I'm like, yeah, that's that's the uh, the upside of not doing it is I'm not doing that. Mm -hmm. For all the mistakes I've made in the business, I'm not doing that. You know, so yeah, I, I mean, it's e hard, but it's also easy when there's so many teachers around doing things wrong. Yeah. Then again, you see Ch Chappelle smokes a lot of pot and it certainly hasn't hurt him. Yeah. So there's always the people who it doesn't affect at all. So tell me about relationships for you then when you're just chasing that dragon, so to speak, of the sex. Are you dating at all in your 20s or are you just yeah. always staying single? I, did you ever fall in love? Oh, sure. Yeah, you yeah. Did. The first girl I you dated. You said you fall easy. For sex workers. I did, yeah. Oh, for sex workers. A lot of times, yeah. And other girls I would get attached to easily. But sex workers you had an immediate access to. So you mm. could connect and then like, oh my God, maybe she likes me, you know. Uh, but yeah, I had a girlfriend uh, from, uh, I guess, 18 to 19. Or first girl was six months. And I fell in love with every girl I dated. Like, I really did. I mean, any girl I was in a relationship with, I fell in love with. But- you, when you when you use people like a drug, like when you use people to like validate you, and when the when the high is in the chase, once you have them, you enjoy it for a little while, but then you start looking around because you want the next thing. It's like compulsive eating or anything. You know, I never want one cookie. When I get it, I want the next thing, the next thing, the next thing. It's like now I'm 55. I'm collecting kiss posters again. Like my midlife <laughs> crisis uh, is fucking old kiss posters. You got the one where they're the uh, military one where they're all wrapped up. You know, that's the 76 about. tour yeah. poster. And not only do I have that, I have that factory sealed. Yeah, there's there's two of them. One says U.S. tour and one says U.S. tour 76. I just remember Peter Chris with the yeah, yeah a little drum. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's a great poster. Yeah. I have that. I, I didn't the, hang that one uh, up. I like Suits the, is great too. Dress to Kill is a great one. That's a great album that's and a, a great. It's a good one. album and a great poster. The poster's better. Um, one of the yeah, one of the posters from the Dress to Kill era is one of the most valuable Kiss posters. But anyway, yeah, I became re obsessed um, recently. My wife fucking hates my poster. She hates it. I mean, uh, you know, this just framed in museum glass. Then frames are worth more than the posters. I'm an ass. <laughs> like I'm an absolute ass, and I know it. Goddamn idiot. But you know, it makes me happy. It but, beats Rolexes. It beats spending money on cars. It beats, you know, you spend a few hundred on a poster and it's irrational, but there's a lot more expensive hobbies to have that could hurt you financially. This is one I can live with. According to the CDC, fewer men than women meet the minimum daily intake recommendations for fruits and vegetables, and men are more likely to overvalue exercise and undervalue nutrition. Enter Ritual, a multivitamin scientifically developed for men to help fill nutrient gaps in their diets. I take a Ritual multivitamin every morning. I take two of them. Helps me start my day off right. I've been using them for years. They've been around for a long time, too. And again, y'all must like them and use them because... They're here, and I love them, and you love them. A science-backed multivitamin for men 18-plus with high-quality and traceable key ingredients in clean, bioavailable forms. 10 key nutrients in two delayed-release capsules per day designed to dissolve later in the small intestine, an optimal place to absorb nutrients. Plus, it's gentle on an empty stomach with a minty essence in every bottle that helps make taking your multis actually enjoyable. Essential for Men is a quality multivitamin from a company you can actually trust. Get 20% off your first month for a limited time at ritual.com slash honeydew. Start Ritual or add Essential for Men to your subscription today. That's ritual.com slash honeydew for 20% off. Now, let's get back to the do. Um, your parents, you said, still together, still alive. Yes. So you, you had a relationship example of, you know, this you know, so to speak, perfect relationship in your house. Yes. And weren't interested in that at all, huh? Zero interest. Zero interest. Yeah, I you mean- You ever talk to your parents about that? Like, how the hell do you two still, do you ever talk about that? No, um, I never thought to. I mean, I, I assume it's because they're from a different era. And, you know, it was a little, people who got married in the 60s and the 50s, for them it was like, well, it's a lifelong commitment and that's it. Um, and then they, you know, they had me and they had my sisters. So where were they going? I mean, I guess they could have got divorced, but I mean, where were they going, really? Yeah. Um, 
You know, I but, feel like you're such an outlier. Do you, has your dad ever talk to you about that shit? No, I mean, uh, I'm not good on the one-on-ones with family. But like, he's open as you are on these microphones and everything they could hear you say, they don't ever come up to you and be like, your dad's never like, what's it like to have a sex worker? No, no, no. The only thing they've ever asked me was uh, when I started going on Opie and Anthony, uh, the first time I was on, I was Dice brought me on and it was a phone call. Um, he had me call into O and A while he was in studio, and they were very nice to me. They loved Dice, and they were only on in New York at this time in the afternoon. This is two thousand, and uh, I was telling them a story about this ex girlfriend who used to piss on me, and she used to piss in a cup, and um, I would, I would, I would, I would take her hands and, and, and have her make me drink it. It was really, I I'd probably scarred her. Yeah, I was, her piss. Oh yeah, yeah. I was having to have her piss in a cup, and I would drink it. You yeah. scarred. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I'm apolo- if she's ever seeing that, I apologize. I really loved you, but I was thirsty. <laughs> so <clears throat> I was telling this story on the radio and uh, my dad called me. He goes, see, so mother and I heard you on the radio. And uh, I was like, oh, yeah. Did they meet that girl? They, now they have a visual. Oh, they knew who she girl. was. Yeah. We, we were broken up by then and she has not spoken to me since. She hates me. Yeah, but I wish she didn't. But I, you know, I was wrong. Uh, and, and, uh, he goes, yeah, that's stuff about the pee. I told your mother you were only kidding. And I remember in that co- conversation, my dad in, in, in his, in his words, without saying it was saying, please be kidding. And I was like, oh yeah, I'm just joking. And we both knew I wasn't, my dad knew I wasn't joking and I knew I wasn't joking, but I knew what he needed to hear was I was just joking, dad. I don't drink piss out of a Dixie cup. And, uh, that's the only time they've ever come to me. And they've seen the act and they like the act, but they know, like, don't, you know, you don't ask questions. So they do support them. Oh, yeah, yeah, they're great. My parents are great. Great senses of humor. Uh, And again, all these years later, they're used to it. You know what I mean? They're used to me just talking about everything. And tell me when you realize or that you or tap really into your your sexual side, that freak side like that. You don't mind drinking piss. You don't. Did someone introduce you to it first? You were like, I want to try that. As a kid, it's all childhood stuff. Like I remember when I lived in Edison. So this is the only time frame. Is this Jersey also? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I moved, I left Edison in Halloween of fourth grade was my first day in North Brunswick. So anything that happened in Edison happened before Halloween of fourth grade. So that's kind of my time frame uh, in the 70s. and I wound up, I remember that there were these twins, um, brother and sister, and I used to get them. I think they were my age. I think the brother, I think they were both my, oh, they were twins. So they were both, or they maybe just brother and sister, they weren't twins. I think, because I think we, he and I were in second grade and she was in third grade. I don't remember. But I used to get them to sit on my face separately because they both pissed their pants, which means our childhood must have been terrible, filled with terror. So like I would go behind the bushes and whichever one of them was around, I would just have them sit on my face and I would breathe in their piss through their pants. So they've already pissed themselves and you're like, get over here and put that yeah, on my face. Yeah, why waste it? I mean, what, what? are you doing? <laughs> well, where does that come from Don't know. for you? <laughs> Don't know. I'm very scent oriented. Okay, so this was your request. This was not them saying, hey, let me sit on your face oh, no. and then you were into it and like, there's the origin story. This is you saying, hey. Yeah. And I, they were down for it. Sometimes, yeah. But I don't remember how that was your first sort of sexual thing you can remember was having a kid with pissed filled pants sit on your face yeah i mean that was, i wouldn't say it was the first but it was in that Early. time period yeah 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 there was a bunch of uh very little naughty jimmy norton like what give me some oh, more I'll be blowing my friends <laughs> fucking oh i was a fucking... <laughs> oh, hold on. you said friends with an s oh friends with an s <laughs> yeah oh yeah yeah multiple friends yeah <laughs> how old are you doing that First, second, third grade. Wow. Yeah. You're terrified. My daughter's in third grade. I'm terrified. I want to wrap this up right now. Go get her out of school. Little girls are probably <laughs> better. They're probably healthier than I was Definitely, at that I age. I believe that. Yeah. But also those boys, like you are in those classrooms. That's yeah. right. Yeah. And you don't remember where that comes from? No, I remember my therapist is, well, they've all told me I was molested, but I'm like, eh. I kind of liked it, and I did like it. And there's a couple of kids I did it with that I was scared of. So wait, you're they're saying that you doing this as a child was molestation? With sexual abuse or whatever. But I'm but like, what yeah. about prior to that? Were you abused it prior to that? Not to Not my that knowledge, you can remember. no. No. And um, I don't think that every deviant experience is based in abuse. I mean, maybe, but I don't remember it, so I can't pretend it was. I mean, a, qu- a couple of them, maybe a couple of the uh, older kids, like that were like kind of bullies. Maybe that was like I remember being very afraid of them, and then maybe you just learn to like it. I don't know. 
But in first grade, second, second grade, grade, yeah, you're, yeah, yeah, you're, you're performing oral sex. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I, and I, and are they doing it back to you as well? Most of them did. Yeah, yeah. Really? Yeah. Oh yeah, they were good eggs. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> and no. <laughs> but by fifth grade, nobody's like this guy sucks dick. Did oh you're boy, you kidding me? By second what? and third grade. <laughs> Which is why we left. I mean, it was because it's the seventies and eighties. That is, you're getting your ass kicked. I got if you called a, f- a lot K-Mart. as a kid. You can't say f- now, but believe me, in 1978, you <laughs> they could. Said it to you. Oh, did they on a megaphone? <laughs> a lot. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I love this sensitivity to the word. It's like you have no idea. I, I don't want to hear it. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, you know, I got. I, I remember being chased and having to jump on my parents' car because they were going to beat me up because I was like, "You sucked your dick," you know. Um, Did you ever have parents talk to your parents about this? Not to my knowledge. I mean, I don't even know if they knew that their kids were little cocksuckers yeah. running around Edison. <laughs> it's a fucking blowjob club. Bunch of little fucking fruits. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so not to my knowledge. I mean, man, that's so young. I'm just sitting here with my head spinning. It's so young for anything. My it first, is, yes. My first French kiss. I didn't. First of all, I didn't even know you could put a tongue in someone's mouth. Sure. My first kiss was a black girl. We had moved to a new place. It was between the summer of fifth and sixth grade. I'm in sixth grade. Well, I'm in like that summer. She's a year older. It's a kid that lives next to us, his older sister. And she and I kiss. Just lip kiss. Yeah. Then I have a girlfriend, you know, sixth grade girlfriend. We just go to movies and shit. And in police academy, she shoves her tongue down my throat. And it it did what whatever happened to you sure. that early on happened to me in that moment yeah. where I was like, this is awesome. Holy shit. Like someone's putting their tongue in my mind. Yeah. I, I didn't even know the concept of right. any of that just blew my mind. And then I was like, oh, that was sort of what awoke me to all that sixth grade. But. You way early. Yeah. And you don't really remember what what it was. The you first just knew one, what you no. Liked. I knew it felt good. Um, it was a dirty secret. I always like scenarios. <clears throat> like I, I like set like in porn even. I like a scenario, a lead up more than the actual sex. Even I've had a many many sexual experiences in my life, but I haven't actually fucked nearly as many people as I could have because so many times the scenario and the lead up is what the turn on is to me. Um, I guess because back then we had to make, we had to, we had to hide or we had to do things sneaky. So I've always kind of like that angle on it because that's how it was when you were a kid. You couldn't let other kids know. But anyway, I get out of Edison when I was in fourth grade. So that reputation didn't follow me to North Brunswick, which was great. So you can start over. Right. Um, you know what I mean? There's yeah. a whole new crop. A whole new crop of yeah. things. And young vaginas too. Uh, pussy scared me at that age though. So that's what I want to ask you. Your first sexual experiences were boys only at first. No, it was girls too. Like, but, they, but they were a little harder to get into. I mean, I remember the 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 the, the girl who would sit on my face with tinkle in her pants. I loved her body. Uh, she was, again, a year older than me. And I remember being like trying to get her to sit on my lap because I loved her smooth, fat ass. As a kid, like I was a big ass fan because a girl put my face on her ass when I was like in, in either second or third grade. And I remember how cool it felt. Jerk. Oh, I know. We were in the woods and she put her big dumper against the my woods. face and I loved it. But it changed my whole, that became like a lifelong fetish, a nice ass on my face. All from that. From that moment. That yeah, crazy. I remember the moment. We'll I was see. kneeling by a tree and her, she put my my face on her big ass cheek and it was the temperature difference was so cool and i just liked it it just felt so like different than anything i'd ever felt um and i didn't know that i should have buried my face in it i was just a boy <laughs> just rest <laughs> but i learned i learned as time went on you know open the cheeks you goose <laughs> get in there <laughs> make sure she didn't miss anything <laughs> oh my god so how old are you when you lose your virginity to a girl? Intercourse, 18. 18. Oh, yeah. wow. That I would not, that surprises me I right know, there. I know. I know. Blowjobs, everything else, way earlier. But intercourse, Why? 18. Don't know. I think I was scared. Yeah. <clears throat> I was scared of sex. I'm going to say you probably had the opportunity to lose it much younger, I would say. Yeah, by a few years. I mean, again, the experiences I was having were so many like little weird sexual things. There wasn't a whole lot of fuck opportunities. Uh, but I also knew that there's pregnancy and there was other risks mm-hmm. with that. 
Um, and I think I had also perform- were the AIDS generation. Like that got pumped into us in high school. At least for me, it was like AIDS. Like that can happen. It you wasn't can die at that point for me. It was no. a few years after that. Okay. Right, right, right. But it did come along after that. But I don't remember AIDS being a, a concern. We were both virgins for a week. It was a big concern. I feel like in our school, everybody was like, and then after that, everybody's like, we're just we're seventeen and horny. What do you want us to do? I know. After Magic Johnson, yeah, you're like, yeah. you know what? We're all dead. Yeah. Let's just let's, let's just enjoy it. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, 18 years old, the first time I actually had intercourse. <clears throat> and that was with a girlfriend? Oh yeah, I really loved her. And, uh, you know, it was, uh, she's somebody I'm still friends with. It's funny. Like we're still friends. We talk, she lives, uh, she moved out of the country years ago, but, um, yeah, it was my first, uh, intercourse was with her and I loved it. What about first intercourse? Did you ever have sex with a man? I have. Yeah. But not, I wasn't big on anal sex. As an adult. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I've done everything. I yeah. mean, uh, yeah. I mean, my wife has a dick. I mean, it's like, it's just, so it's like. You know, it's been a part of who I am. What do you prefer? You know, it depends on the day. I mean, it really does. I like, believe you. I haven't had a vagina in a long time, but I th- people say like, you, you're gay because you with so many trans. I'm like, I would tell you if I was. It's, it's, I'm definitely not straight. You're not straight if you're married to someone with a dick. <laughs> Again, I know sociology <laughs> professors and gender studies professors. <laughs> you're hetero. They're fucking dumb glasses with things hanging off their glasses. You know, those fucking progressives that think they're just saying something so earth Telling mm-hmm. someone who is something Shut the what fuck the fuck up. Fuck you're not. Yeah. yeah, tell yourself what you want. I don't yeah. care how other people, I, but be, let's be realistic about it. Because when you're not realistic, you lose everybody who would might otherwise be inclined to hear you out because you sound like a, a special interest parody and nobody wants to hear you. Um, so no, but I do like pussy. I just haven't because I'm married. So it's like, you know, I'm in that position where you sacrifice something when you, you know, fall in love. And I'm very happy, but I mean, that is something I still love. I wish I could partake in. What's the first time you're with a, a trans? You know, I don't think I knew it at first. I didn't like it at first. I was, first time I saw somebody trans was Sulka in 1983 or 84, watching porn. She was a trans porn star in the 80s. Uh, but I didn't know what it was. I just knew like, oh, all right. Like it clicked. It meant something. Um but I mean, when I was getting uh, hookers down in New Brunswick, I didn't want trans girls. Um, you know what I mean? I didn't want to be gay. Like I just wanted, I was just getting blowjobs. But a few of them I remember like, uh, like, I think so. <laughs> I think so. I think so. Right, yeah, but in hindsight, to. yeah. Uh, but then there was one girl, like one, this is when I was in my 20s doing comedy. And I picked her up and I just drove her back to like Jersey City. She just asked me for a ride because I was going home. And uh, she lived in the projects in Jersey City. So she kind of liked me and she's like, hey, let's hang out. So it was just because she liked me, we hung out and I fucked her, uh, raw dogged it. I mean, I was a trooper. I really was. It was That was Desert Storm. I went right Desert in. Desert Storm. <laughs> and she's, uh, but I knew she was trans. But I, 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 I so I started telling those stories. Was that stories. your first time? Uh, no, first, I, anal? Sex. Maybe. Yeah. I don't remember. I mean, to be very honest. Uh but I remember when I started talking about it publicly, which was probably around 2003, I was half honest. I would talk about it, but I would say like I didn't know. I would lead into it like everybody pretends they don't know. And there were times where I didn't when I was younger. But once you see it, you always, you know. Yeah. Uh, I had one trans girl tell me, you have the eye. Like you always, I spot it from a mile, you know. I could tell somebody's transgender by their shadow. Like I just <laughs> fucking, <laughs> I know it. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah but uh but you know you're still dealing like younger generation is nicer they're gentler with this stuff as much as they're annoying and as much as they're fake compassionate and actually vicious little pricks who try to pretend they're compassionate but they're really vicious um with that they're better like they're you know you're not automatically going to be called a f- because you like something you know what i mean like they're a lot better with stuff like that so uh it was hard talking about it as to, you know, because again, you, you, you talk about so much and then as you keep peeling layers of the onion publicly, you're like, how are people going to react to this? But it still felt good to get to talk about it. Yeah. And also there's no internet at first back then. You know what I mean? Right. So, so once the internet comes out and then the world sees trans, sees all these different things, piss videos, yeah. shit videos. It starts to normalize after a while, at least where you're not so like, what are you even talking about? You know what I mean? But yeah, now it's so, div- it's, it's it's more divisive now than it was five years ago because of all the stuff with, uh, it's now such a political thing. Like with the whole 
stupidity, uh, the anger, the dumb anger over Bud Light. Who gives a fuck who's on a beer can? Like, it's just such a meaningless fight. Um, but, you know, activists have gotten so crazy with trans women in sports. And then parents are like, hey, I'm, yeah, I'm kind of like on your side, but my daughter's just trying to swim and win. And you're pretending you don't see the physical difference. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it's all pretend. I mean, the yeah. whole country's pretending. We're all, you know, you know, conservatives are pretending that they're actually righteous and that none of them cheat on their wives. And progressives are pretending that there's zero physical difference. And it's, it's just, it's nonsense. It's all nonsense. So talk to me about the married life now. You're really into it, huh? Love it. I love it. You do. There's times where it annoys me and the things that I thought would annoy me do. She's a fucking, she sleeps. It's like, I, I now know how Poland felt when Germany walked in. That's what it's like oh, sleeping with my fucking wife. Just splayed out because she's six feet tall all over the fucking place. Um, I hate being touched in my sleep. So those little things. What do you mean? You don't like to be touched while no. you sleep? Why? I'm not, I don't know. What is that Not because I was about? molested or anything. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't just don't like it. I'm weird Do you with wake that. immediately if someone puts their hand on your back or I anything wake if like she, that? If she thinks about it, I wake up. <laughs> you I go, do, huh? don't, don't do it. Like, I know you want <laughs> to. I don't do want to be caressed. <laughs> Fuck off. Sleep. But I love her and I love to cuddle. But when it's time for bed, it's time for bed. Um, Tell me this then. What do you what do you miss about being single? Because I'm 50, about to be 51, like I said. And I, you know, I, I, I it's funny. I thought I'd be married by, I don't know, 27. You know, right. growing up in Maryland, you know, by 30, whatever, tops. I'm still not. But I'm I'm open to it. I'm not I'm not one of those people. It's like nah, I don't give a shit. Right. Because also, if it happens to me at seventy, I only got to live with that one person. For Absolutely. What? How many? Ten, fifteen Tolerate years. Tolerate him I got for that. a few years. Spend I don't know all if the I money. Could put up with someone for sixty <laughs> years. Like, do you ever do you ever ask your you don't your parents how they do that? You're right. They're from a different era, but still, these days they could just be like, ah. I won't. I'm sure to. you guys are all grown out of the house and everything. Knowing I won't have to helps. Like knowing, again, I'm 55, mm -hmm. she's 26. She's going to be alive without me. Um, and that kind of scares her, yeah, she that, says. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, big age difference. Uh, but, you know, it's like I don't uh, – I don't. what would I miss about it? I would think the addiction. I miss feeding into my addiction, even though it's really unhealthy and it's horribly depressing and lonely. Um, you know, I haven't cheated on my wife. Now, any guy would say that. But I can tell you, I've cheated on every other partner. Um, I have not had sexual, I haven't touched another person. It's insane that I haven't come with another person. You know what I mean? I've done like, I've watched porn, text message, like, you know, things I shouldn't have done, but I have not cheated on. It's fucking insane to say that as a person who's cheated on everyone. So I miss that. I miss the addiction sometimes. I miss running out and doing what I want and calling an escort. Like, but I, I just don't want to do it because I'm afraid I won't stop doing it. Um, so you like that chase. You do. I love it. Sure. I mean, even though it's really unhealthy and it always makes but me even feel picking lonely. Up, even going back to picking up a prostitute, there was more to it than it's a different mindset than seeing a lady at a bar and having to walk up to her and hi, I'm Jim. And, yeah. You know, what you know? And try to strike up that small talk and everything like all that bullshit's out of the way. No, you have that. Worker. You have it a little bit too with them, though, because I was ritualistic. Like, a, okay, I would pull up. I would only talk to them if they came in on the passenger side window. Um, Why is that? I don't know. It just became like this if OCD thing. They came thing. to the driver's side now. Occasionally, but mostly the passenger side. I also felt it was safer to put distance between us because mm -hmm. you don't know who you're dealing with, um, and you could just have a little conversation for a minute before they get in. Well, there were times where women got in the car and we would drive. Um, and I realized like, yeah, I'm just, I'm not that attracted to her. I don't want to do this. So I would pay him anyway and just drop him off and go, you know what? I got to get home, but here, take it. And they never minded. Yeah. Um, so I liked the conversation. I always liked the conversation. I always liked hanging out, talking a little bit. Um, this way the sex feels like, it just feels like more connected, I guess, uh, without the burden of real connection. You know what I mean? Without the the pressure of really being connected, like and faithful. So you have like these mini relationships. Um, but I never looked at sex workers as like disposable or shit. Like, ah, I can just tie her up. And like, I, I looked at it like it was a, a mini relationship. Mm -hmm. um, and it was transactional, of course. But when I was a kid, sex was transactional. Like when me and my friends would blow each other, we would trade sucks. Um, what do you mean? We would count sucks. One, <laughs> two. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then it's like, hey, I gave you 20. You got to give me 20. And he would give 20. Yeah. Holy shit. 
<laughs> where so, are you going to do this stuff? This where was you- in the woods in Edison. Um, there were so many places. Hallways. Hallways? Where? In apartments. I lived in the apartments growing up in Edison. Oh, like a complex? Yeah, yeah. Gotcha. I mean, we'd always find... I mean, look, when you're a kid, if you want to blow someone or get blown, there's always room. You can always find a place to trade sucks. So it was like a transactional thing. And I didn't realize that until, you know, the last few years. Like, sex was always transactional for me. It was always... I guess with the bullies, <clears throat> it was a way to not get beaten up. To have these... Because there was... Two kids in particular, one really who I was terrified of, and I would do that to him. So my therapist, I think, pointed out to me that that was like a transactional thing. That was, I'll do this, and you won't you do that. You don't kick my ass. Yeah. Oh, God. But I guess I've associated pleasure with it, so I didn't realize that's what it was. But it became, I guess, so that was where it started being transactional, and then trading, uh, 20 for you, 20 for me, and that was just how it carried on through my life. Like it just, transactional became the way sex was. And in that sex worker world, you were never robbed or nothing like that? No. Never in danger? I'm not saying never in danger. There was a few times where I was, but I always have a very good sense of danger. Like, and most times, you know, I'm not a threatening person and I'm not, I was never into anything violent or, or, or being abusive. So I, if I felt something was wrong, I would leave the situation and usually pay the person. And, you know, even in that world, if you just leave and there's no issue, no, people don't want to go to jail. There's usually no reason for somebody to fuck with you. Like, you know I mean, I, I'd also, also got very lucky and I have very good instincts. So I was super careful um, and feeling people out and talking to them. But I, I had things happen like I would have somebody over the house. And I remember some girl went into the, and I could hear her doing coke in my bathroom. And I'm like, what am I fucking like? What if she is? A, uh, what if she dies? Mm-hmm. What if she has a fucking heart attack? This and like, is where my this is why I always never even yep. It's exactly it, no, it had nothing to do with me. I didn't <laughs> give her the coke. Like all of a sudden, like look at this situation and how bad. And I had a couple of girls. Uh, one girl tried to like blackmail me for my dirty text messages. She's like, well, I could show them. And I'm like, first of all, this is a felony you've just committed. Second of all, go ahead. Everyone knows I'm a pervert. I'll just, and then you can pay for lawyers when they sue you. Go fuck yourself. <laughs> like, so that really, that angle of it, I was really never worried about. Mm-hmm. Um, that's the one advantage to being single and being comfortable being who you are. Um, despite the shame. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> being right. comfortable making it funny. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You right. know what I mean? It's yeah. like, I'd take the embarrassment. I mean, it would be embarrassing, but I'll take that. And then just, I knew that like her paying for lawyers would be a lot worse than me being embarrassed. And then the next day she apologized. And I was like, it's, it's cool. We're good. Don't worry. You know, um, but I'm not, I, I'm filled with shame. But when I'm talking dirty to somebody and they're talking dirty to me, that's just what we're doing as adults. And you know what I mean? Like, I don't care. What's the, Give me some of the freakiest sexual stuff you've done. You know, it's mostly the stuff we've talked about, like just being pissed on. Um, little cuckolding stuff. I'm not into hardcore uh, domination, like at all. Um, I can spank and talk dirty. I've done that type of stuff, but I'm not a dominant person sexually by nature, unless it's verbal. I'm really good at that. Like, and I'm very good at, at playing those roles. But physically, I would much rather be a sub. Um, strap on, I could never really do. Um, I dated the dominatrix once. And uh, she kept dated. Trying, oh yeah, we really became like a real relationship for years, and she quit the business, and she wanted to peg me, uh, but I just kept hurting, and she, I was just so ashamed that I couldn't accommodate her. Um, she had a purple strap on. I would run in the bathroom, and you go fucking Jim, and I was like, sorry, I'm sorry, you know, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry, my little hiney hurts. <laughs> <laughs> But it was mostly that stuff, oh, like shit. mostly that stuff of, again, piss. And uh, so much of my stuff wasn't freaky. It was more like having girls come over, giving them money to sit on my face while I jerked off, like just stuff like that. Like it was a lot of it was just there was such a large amount of it, but the acts themselves were not crazy. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like there was nothing that crazy. Um, I said, again, were you in the humiliation? not doing it unless the woman was really into it. Mm-hmm. Like for me, the turn on and stuff like cuckolding or any type of humiliation is if it turns her on that I'm seeing this really sexy, dirty part of her like that. She's there, so there's a really weird, it, it may be a lie, but it feels like intimacy. Like when someone is letting you know that they have these bizarre fantasies or these really dark thoughts, it's like you're that turns you on and it turns me on that. It turns you on. 
Like not the actors. Mm-hmm. I've had women talk about things that didn't turn me on at all. But the fact that they liked it, I was like, oh fuck, like that's so hot that I know more about her than somebody she's worked with for 10 years. Like she's a school teacher and she yeah. wants me to piss on her. Like no one knows that about her. <laughs> but yet she's giving me that private thing. Like, so there was something so connecting about that. And I didn't realize at the time, like it really was a search for some kind of a weird connection, but it was the endless search for- Well, it goes back to doing that as a kid where you're hiding what you're doing and you're getting that pleasure too. Yeah. You know, the woods, a hall, you, what you said, if you want to find a spot, you'll find a spot. Yeah, the sneakiness of yeah. it. Right, so right. knowing the secrets. Right, you're somebody, in on this and I'm in, I won't tell if you don't tell. I won't yeah. tell if you don't yeah. tell. And somebody sharing their secrets with me really would turn me on a lot. Um, and I loved it. So yeah, that's the type of stuff- where uh, we can, you can go anywhere in fantasy. It's great. Um, and, and it's funny how many people will shame people for things they like sexually. And I, I, don't, I don't mean things that are hurtful or fucking kids. I mean, like just yeah, things that are, you know, weird or, or S&M related or any of this stuff. Um, I mean, there's guy. I, I don't understand a lot of it. You know, the woman I dated who was a dominatrix, she said there was guys who wanted their balls kicked. Like that one blows me away. I don't I watch get it. these Japanese dudes online where um they'll have they'll lay in their tidy whities yep. and they'll have these cute um Japanese girls in like bikinis or whatever and high heels and they fucking just stomp. Yeah. Stomp. Stiletto in the bag. Stomp. Yeah. Stomp. The and dick. then some of them come. And I'm like, how in the fuck could you come in that kind of paint? Like that's wild. Yeah. What's what brand then you got yeah. What's crossed? What, why, <laughs> what wires? Right. Right. What wire is touching the third rail <laughs> and 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 redirecting what this feeling should be to your pleasure center? Like that should be unpleasant and fearful, and yet that one stray wire is touching the third rail and it's just and it's, it, it's putting the current in the pleasure center. Yeah, yeah, it's wild. Yeah, and I have that with a lot of things too. But I, I like I, I go through phases like feet. Um, for a long time, I was into feet, and I was never into feet. But then when I became, you say into them, fucking them, nah, looking at them, uh, kissing I feel so them, silly. licking them, what? Smelling them What's and licking them. Uh, but, but just fucking them, I would feel like such a boob holding two feet together while she does an ab exercise. Oh, <laughs> an ab. <laughs> <laughs> She's fucking probably sitting there, back hurts, doing core work, so I can fucking, I can get a new high. Poor girl. No, I was never, I, I've done that stuff. But then after a while, like I liked sexy big feet on a woman. Um, and then all of a sudden it just fades away. Like, you know, you you just run through periods where you're like this and periods where you're like that. Like I envy people who aren't like this. So like, you have cycles. Cycles. Not, not, feet aren't your fucking thing no. forever. And all. I don't you feel, know what sub- I mean? Right. And I like the idea of being submissive with them, but I'm not like a real like, oh, you're tootsies. Like, I'm not like, like that. It's more... It, it like one woman I used to talk to was really dominant and liked to make guys wear panties, but she liked it, so it turned me on. So I would do it because it turned her on. But if it didn't turn a woman on, I would never just show up in thigh highs <laughs> yeah. and go, hey, "What do you? What do you think? <laughs> Who's a pretty girl?" Um, like Jane Gum. Um, <laughs> it has to be very, very much their thing mm-hmm. because somebody doing something just for me. I never really liked uh, because that's not the secret. I'm the same. Yeah. I'm the exact same. And also they have to be comfortable with you enough and safe with you enough to tell you that thing and hope to God you don't shame them or be like, what the fuck are you talking about? Yeah. I think I, and and that's one thing I've heard probably because I've been open about my own shit. I've heard that from so many women have told me these things about themselves that are really private and really would humiliate them. But I think they know I'm not going to judge them. Like, I'm never going to say, eh, like, even if it's not my thing, even if it's something I'm not necessarily into at all, I'm not going to scold them because they get turned on by talking about it or by thinking about it or by watching videos of it. Like, you know what I mean? I think they knew that they were at least safe to tell me. Right. And the response would never be, what? You fucking never. And I didn't ever. Um, and I've heard some things that just weren't for me, but you know, hey, if you want to fuck a horse, if you can find one, God bless. Have you really had people? Of say, course, yeah, of course, yeah. Uh, but I don't even think they would have done it. They just liked the idea of it because they were dirty, so they knew they could explore that. And if they told me I wouldn't care. Again, it doesn't really turn me on. Like, ugh, fucking horses smell. Yeah, the big dumb animals. I don't want. I just it's not my thing. But if that's what you like. Go ahead. I don't care. 
This has been awesome, dude. Thank I you. gotta tell I didn't you, mean to it's, on the horse it's been very enlightening to sit and talk to you about all this. But I wanted to. I've been wanting to talk to you. Yeah, about this all is this. great. Thank you, man. Sure, thank um, you. Your first time here, so before we wrap up and promote everything again, yes. advice you'd give to your sixteen-year-old self: Take an acting lesson, you blinky little idiot. <laughs> You blinky little <laughs> Take a fucking acting lesson, you fucking no audition landing fool. <laughs> Stop playing with your nipples. It's going to be a lifelong obsession. Stop it. I would tell myself that. All right. That's great advice. I've heard deep advice from people. Love yourself. For me, take an acting lesson. Continue to hate yourself because it's going to make you a lot of money someday. And stop playing with your nipples. <laughs> That's great, dude. Thank you. Thank you for doing this. Thank you. It was fun. Um, please promote everything again. JimNorton.com for dates. I got I got some gigs in California here, like Monterey, Petaluma. Um, I got uh, Rogan's Club uh, in March. I'm doing the Mothership. I got Pittsburgh, Houston, Dallas. Um, Buffalo is on sale now. I got uh, kind of everywhere. Indianapolis, Oklahoma, all these places I haven't been to or haven't been to in years. Kentucky. Uh, so I hope people come out and see me. All right. And uh, Nikki and Jim NYC is this YouTube channel. I do it, my wife. And it's just little pieces of our lives because everybody seems to have an opinion on what a relationship like ours is like. So we're just showing like little slices of it. That's it. Hope people right. like it. Thank you again. Thank for you. Real. Uh, as always, Ryan Sickler on all your social media. Come see me on tour. Tickets are available at ryansickler.com. We'll talk to you all next week.